Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome in my um, home studio. Uh, everybody's being at home uh, during the cri this crisis. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about um, the way we use at Rabobank uh, anomaly detection to find strange patterns in customer behavior. Um, let's just do a brief introduction. Um, I work at Nairode, but I also work at Rabobank, or I work at Rabobank and also work at Nairode Business University, and I have my own company, Grio, that works on intelligence solutions. I work uh, as a machine learning business analyst, consultant, insight and feature inside the Rabobank. I do some coding myself, so some of the things you will see today are done uh, by me, myself. And, and the other way, I, I have a team around me that uh, helps me with um, establishing the results uh, we, uh, we are doing. Um, large scale on anomaly detection is something I want to talk to you about. Mm, because um, we at Rabobank have approximately 10 million uh, customers, some, something like that, and we want to have an idea on what they are doing and if they are um, behaving well. In fact, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, um, apply artificial intelligence to find just this guy, the fraudster. We think, okay, this is, this is nice, you can do artificial intelligence to classify images or classify parts of images and we want to do a find this guy. Why? Hmm, because it's interesting because we want to protect our financial system. We want to uh, prevent fraud. We want to prevent uh, money laundering. We want to prevent uh, terrorism financing and stuff like that. Um, to do that, we have um, since 2008 a program in uh, monitoring and what we do we monitor all customers and customer behavior um, with a, a few things we use risk shield uh, and uh, some talks uh, later this morning or in the day about risk shield and real-time monitoring um, on based based upon business rules and we use uh, rabomel that's a coining of big ml to do the machine learning and the automation of that we do monitoring on a lot of lot of lot of areas so that's not only fraud that's where we started off in 2008 uh, but we do anti-money laundering we do correspondent banking terrorism financing market abuse monitoring so if there are people and traders inside rabobank that are misusing their power of um to do, to do deals uh we do sanctions we do client screening our customers inside panama papers yes or no conflicts of interest do that's about corruption uh, customer integrity do customers strain things uh, cdd customer due diligence um is a customer a customer we want to have so all around kyc know your customer and customer due diligence do customers things we expect of them how do we monitor we have um, a real-time decision engine that is fed in with data transactions customers all kind of profiles and things we uh, we want to get in we have a real-time decision engine that has uh, in-memory databases, uh, business rules, and machine learned models, and it will create actions and signals. It's super fast. We do approximately 10 million transactions per day, um, and we use contexts uh, for all customers all the time um, for our decision and our business, so our business rules and for our <laughs> I was thinking my door opened for my business rules and for my machine learning. So every every transaction, every action that comes through the system is being evaluated in memory 
uh, with the in-memory client profiles, we uh, make explicit rules on uh, if this, then that. Um, some fuzzy rules that say if it's a little bit like this, then do that. And we use uh, PMML, uh, predictive model markup language, as a, as, a, as a standard to execute machine learned models. Um, this is a little bit the context. We go into uh, some of the technologies a little bit deeper further on, but this is a little bit the context. So we are at Rabobank, 10 million customers. We do 10 million transactions a day, and we do monitoring in large scale. So um, then we come to what, uh, so what we want to do, automatic risk automatic risk detection for KYC process. So KYC, know your customer. We are a bank with 10 million customers, as I said, and we have um, not 10 million account managers or an equiv equivalent from that. And we want to know what our customers are doing to make a decision about risk we take or risk we have having that customer or if customers are doing um, ab abnormal processes or fraudulent process or are, are caught into frauds. What we use for that is our domain knowledge, because most of the things you can talk about uh, in, in these sessions is, okay, how to do machine learning, how to do uh, rules, how to do um, uh, gen uh, uh, neural networks, how to do uh, anomaly detection, etc. But it all starts by the, with business knowledge of knowing how your business looks like and which data is important in your business process. And if your business process is risk detection for KYC, know your customer processes, then you need to have an idea on what data is useful to, to use in that anomaly detection or detection or monitoring scenario. Um, that's a lot of work. I can tell you if you go into the bank, we have approximately uh, a thousand systems uh, data that is coming all from all kinds of places from the bank. And what you want to do is you want to shed some light on that data, although it's messy and make some picture out of that. You want to make that beautiful picture that says, okay, I have this data, I have this customer with, uh, with this profile and it is a good customer or this is a profile with the customer and by the way it's not he's not behaving well or this is a transaction this transaction could be fraud or is fraud this is a transaction that goes from a to b and by the way this could be money laundering this is what you want to say based upon data that's within your bank and you do not know how, what shape what the exact shape of the fraud or the money laundering or the terrorism financing or whatever it is. So you do not, you, you have a clue because you have some cases from the past, but those cases may not be how the, how the, the crooks, the, the, the fraudsters operate momentarily. Therefore we have, as I've shown you already, some monitoring infrastructure and this monitoring infrastructure drives on the concept and Roy Kornikulan is going to talk to you about this uh, later on today, uh, hybrid AI, where you say, okay, I have a knowledge base, I have some, what I uh, just told you, uh, some, some rules and regulations, and I have machine learning, and I want to combine them. And to do that, I, I am very, I'm in a regulated environment, so I cannot do uh, anything I want because the Dutch bank uh, and the ECB is looking over my shoulder and saying, okay, Jan, um, hmm, you are doing machine learning, but you need to be uh, auditable, explainable, robust, and repeatable. Momentarily, we in the project we're going to talk to you about um, uh, further on, we are under audit and the auditors ask us about these things. Are you, are you audible? Is it repeatable what you do? Can I repeat what you did in your machine learning platform in an other, another envi other environment? Can you um, explain that things are robust, audible and explain? And explain is a very interesting, interesting thing. Most of the 
people who do machine learning, mm, explainability is a little bit a problem. Auditability is also a problem, robustness is a problem, repeatability is a problem, because if you have a team of data scientists and they make some nice um, Python code, mm, can you repeat that uh, instantly for a regulator that comes by and says, okay, I have here data, can you re repeat what you did? Um, hmm, if you have a very good system and a very good team that can, that and, and they keep track of everything that they do, yes, they can. Explainability is a, is a different thing. Can you explain the outcome of a decision or outcome of an anomaly? And that's interesting because I want to have, I need to have to say to the Dutch bank and to the customer, this is what I found. And by the way, um, these, these features with these values uh, contributed to this um, decision. And that looks a little bit trivial, but that isn't. Most of the things you see in the general machine learning community is that you have an explanation of a model on a high level. So the model thinks uh, income is an important feature. But in this decision, income might not be the most important feature. Um, the cash, uh, cash deposits could be the most important feature. So um, from a global to a local explanation. Um, that's what we do and what we did and what we found in BigML. Um, and we coined it for Rabobank, we coined it RaboML. Um, um, because it's nice, because uh, we have a nice new logo with new colors um, and it's underneath, it's uh, purely uh, BigML. And we not we're not using it in the cloud, we're using it on-prem. We have two data centers with the Rabobank, and in those two data centers, uh, BigML, RaboML is uh, running on a few servers. Um, why do we want, want to use a platform? I've also already said uh, we want to use auditability, explainability, robustness, and repeatability. That's one of the, the things. And by the way, I want to be able to make simple models. Uh, simpler the better. Because uh, you can imagine if uh, we make decisions about a customer or a loan or a fraud, then uh, it should be explainable to the analyst what the model has said, how the model came to the conclusion. And the simpler the model, uh, the better it, and the easier it is to explain what the model did. Um, for big ML, that's a little bit different different because most of the even the complex models uh, come with an explanation so even the deep net and the samples they come with an explanation this this uh this uh th these features contributed uh, mostly to this uh, this decision but uh, notice that if you go into this area there are always simpler models that perform most most likely uh, as well as the complex ones and it's very easy to, to create complex models. Uh, when you go into the, the machine learning environment and communities, it is um, very easy to make uh, a complex uh, neural network. Last uh, evening, I spoke to a good colleague of mine, Cor, and he talked to me about, uh, he, he is working with um, epidem uh, ep epidemicologists, oh, difficult word, um, and they had um, an internship, uh, a guy that um, did um, on some uh, um, virus and bacteria detection data, uh, did a very nice uh, convolu convolutional neural network and came to a position of approximately 87%. Uh, Core um, took the same data set, threw it into BigML and said, ah, AutoML. Mm. Um, make a model and it came up with a logistic regression that had a, had a performance of 99%. So the deep net not always performs better, depends on the data and the problem you have. But if you have in mind that complex models are always better, then you end up with probably very complex models that are less explainable 
And perhaps if you are talking, and Charlie was talking, hinging about that uh, yesterday, if you have a very complex model that also have repercussions on your evaluation time. So um, this is uh, only uh, supported by the work of Cynthia Rudin. Uh, look that up if you if you want uh, nice discussions on what is um, what are complex models and how to make them more simple. What we do in Rabobank, um, we use BigML now for approximately two years, one and a half year. Uh, we have real models in production because that's a thing. We do not have models that only look like, look, they're nice, but they're really in production. They're running 24 seven. We uh, do uh, CDD anomalies. We're going to talk about a lot more about that. We do false positive reduction in uh, some processes. We, we saw that we had, um, uh, 30,000 alerts on a on a certain uh, topic, and we could reduce with a simple uh, tree-based algorithm the 30,000 to 4,000, and the 4,000 meaning that an analyst need not to look at 30,000, but at 4,000. So that's a that's a, for us a huge productive uh, and production improvement. We use no fraud. And you see, uh, if you if you look here, you see that the the, the performance of the models would, should be very 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 high because we have, as I said, 10 million transactions a day. Fraud is mm, let's say 100, so that's a very very unbalanced uh, data set. We use uh, data drift. Um, we do uh, data drift detection because we found that. Uh, and our models and our rules didn't perform anymore. So we thought, okay, what was happening? Somebody in IT changed uh, a value of a, a data, data point. And with that, um, the rules and the models didn't perform anymore. So we built in the data drift uh, detection and we do that automatically. So every weekend I get a, a nice report on the quality of the data. We do a default predictions, so which uh, agricultural uh, companies we have and cl clients of us go into default and we were able to with a, a data set to predict 70% um, uh, of the defaults three years before uh, uh, on um, mm, uh, yeah three years before before it happens um, and we do some audit uh, audit driven audit driven uh, d d data analysis so the only thing they can do with audit they can throw in some data they can look at the data make some anomaly detection or an association discovery and that's that's it and they improve their uh, audit work with uh, uh, days and and things so we have um, 175 users in uh, RaboML BigML mostly non-IT staff uh, and we do all kinds of projects so 175 people working uh, regularly with uh, BigML. Uh, how do we do it? We have a very, very small team. We're going to talk about this a little bit further later on, but we need a place to experiment and work because what we do and what you do when you start off with machine learning and AI, it will be experimenting. It's not, mm, it's not okay, I have a clear requirement. You will see that later on that there is no requirement. There is only a question and I want to find out and I have to look at the data. And, and that's a little bit a different process than just starting off. Okay, I have a perfect, and mostly you don't, but I have a perfect idea how the world looks and I want to make an application that reflects that perfect knowledge of the world. Because that's mostly not. So we have a, a, an AI and big desk we do some plays uh, together. This is a team that works on um, this really, really, really cool. And I in, included Big Mel and, and Tom because I think I, I just tonight I, was, I woke up and I thought, okay, mm, I have a very large data science team. In fact, they're not around, but they they work they work with me. Uh, in the cases we have, we had a very small project team that. Uh, did it. There's one lead, two team members, and four IT support. They work very hard on uh, creating the infrastructure to run uh, the system on and to, to run uh, Risk Shield. They run BigML, they run the scripts, they run the automation tasks. 
but only uh, seven people. And the rest of the program was uh, approximately 200 people. So we were with Cali Miro in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, talking about um, the idea of data science, digital transformation, artificial intelligence, um, we always attack this idea from a business perspective. So I had a discussion with the auditor this uh, week and said, yeah, Jan, um, data science, you should need to prove how the algorithm works. I said, yeah, but that's data science. Yeah, this is data science. And now I'm, I'm, I'm looking from it from a business perspective because that's on, on the only way I can identify, identify the, um, the, um, the, the outcome and value the outcome of a machine learning algorithm or an AI. So this was the context. So we did some context. Uh, Rabobank, we do a lot of uh, work on monitoring. I, I'm working in the compliance department, so not in the IT department. Mm, and with that, we do machine learning, we do anomaly detection, we do all kinds of experiments and try to put things in production as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, customer due diligence, CDD, and KYC, know your customer, are hot topics. This is in Dutch, but it says um, there is a lot of uh, Witwasser money laundering. So what, what's called Witwasser here is, mon is, is money laundering. Um, uh, Rabobank is being mentioned. Um, we, we need a lot of staff to do that. And in, in the Netherlands, there is going to is being 13 mil billion euros uh, money laundering estimation. So this is a lot of money. There's a lot of money going on and it's a hot topic. Uh, only um, the five largest bank already employ, I think momentarily 6,000 CDD KYC analysts to identify the risks with the customer manually. Um, I told you already, uh, Rabobank has 10 million customers. Can you imagine that you have to evaluate every customer on his behavior and then make an assessment? Um, an assessment takes approximately hmm, between three and eight hours. Uh, 10 million times is a undoable thing. So, uh, and it's trending. Um, that's very good. I looked at Google Trends searches for money laundering in the Netherlands, so Witwasser, um, and we are on a 15-year high, I find out. So in January uh, 2004, it was, uh, Witwasser wasn't mentioned in uh, Google Trends, but now uh, it's, it's really almost not off the chart, but very high. Um, and why is it important? Why do, we, why do we care? We care because legal, we have sanctions, AML, we have some law. We want to do loss prevention. We want to prevent uh, fraud and reputation. We don't, do not want to come into the news as the bank that launders money or uh, facilitates uh, money laundering. Uh, that's not what we want to have. So uh, for the customer due diligence, we, have, we um, thought of, yeah, you could have, do that manually, so 10 million um, 10 million customers doing the math um, takes a lot of time. Um, but do we have data on customers and on customer behavior that could help us permanently, permanently, permanently monitor our customers? We identified 10 risk indicators and you, uh, wait a minute, I need to close the door because this is, uh, it wasn't working, working me already. We have identified 10, custom, uh, 10 risk indicators uh, amongst uh, geographical risk, um, structure risk. If, if you are in the risk environment, you could look this up because it's uh, in the literature all over. And there's one very important one that is transaction risk. And that's where we focus on. We said, okay, we know a lot about transactions. In fact, we do 10 million a day, so we could uh, infer some behavioral patterns from that and see if we can do some mm, uh, detection uh, and monitoring upon that. So this is the decision I want to make because it is not 
primarily trying to find money launderers or money laundering because we have a few lines of defense if something that say something uh, the first line of defense is the rules if a transaction comes in and it looks suspicious then we have to look but at cdd we want to decide on the relation with our clients related to compliance and integrity that's more a broader sense of looking at the problem we want to and the, the decision I want to make is increase monitoring, stay on the current regime or exit the customer. So I want to just, it's a nice customer. I want to increase monitoring or I want to exit the customer. Is the behavior of the customer abnormal compared to the peer group based upon data of his payments, from his payments? That's what we try to formulate as a question. And the data is account information, payments, wire transfer, cash, denominations, uh, country information on customer and payments. That's a little bit what we found as a starting point for this task. Um, you have to know, um, a 10 million customers, and we do not have labels. We have some labels, but the labels are limiting us because if I only look at the labels of things that went wrong in the past, that's normally what you would do with machine learning, especially in the, in the supervised area, then you would end up with the things you already saw. But we wanted to be able to detect behavior uh, that is strange and we did not find it before. That's the daunting task. And what is happening around us and why is it such a, because there's a series of scandals. Look it up, Panama Papers, money laundering scandal with the ING, Russian laundromats, Danske Bank, IBM got fined in 2019, etc. It's all over the place. The Rabobank is also in that, in that list, etc. So uh, we want to we want to tackle this, and we are looking for the unknown unknowns. Uh, that's the that's the tricky part because if you know it, uh, then you can make uh, rules about it. If you have um, a flooding or an election, all the things that have known parts in it, you can tackle with kind of supervised learning. But now we have unknown unknowns. We do not know that there is a new Russian laundromat because the guys who launder money, they do not sit still and in, they, they watch the news very carefully and say, okay, Rabobank is um, finding new anomalies in in Russian, uh, going the money going to Estland. Oh, they know they're on us now. We're going to uh, transfer the money now to Finland instead of Estland. So we leave. So we, we leave the route of Estland and we go to Finland or to Norwegian or to Denmark. And we want to tackle and we want to find that. So um, we we tapped into this uh, idea of early detection of unwanted behavior. We have some data on clients, operations, and we want to have multiple level of anomaly scores to find abnormal patterns in our, our customer behavior. We take historical data, we create peer groups, um, we make per peer group an anomaly detector, and we find anomalous situations in our data set and in our client base. That's the task, that's the task. Um, and we want to be doing that automatically because you can now think on, hey, uh, how many times do I do this? If I do this once, so I do it once, I make a model. So most of the time you make a model and then you make it once and then you let the model uh, operate and then after a period of time or if the model deteriorates in his behavior, then you're going to rebuild it. Uh, we decided to, okay, we want to do this every week. So we, every week I want to assess all the data of all my customers, 10 million, and then uh, make an assessment on the risk uh, that customer is. Taking into the current historical data uh, and, and his peer groups and his peers. So that was, this, this is the context and I'm going to dive a little bit uh, to the nerdy side, I thought. This is what we want to do with anomaly detection. We want to find the red egg. Because if you only think on the, the, the situation that you say, okay, 2% of or 1% of my customers could behave abnormal, then I already talk about 100,000 customers. And 
with the reasoning we had before that is also almost impossible to assess in a reasonable time. And uh, if I'm ready, um, then the new batch starts because um, behavior and criminal, criminal behavior just shifted. I think uh, Skiba is going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so we wanted anomaly detection. What's anomaly detection? That's uh, isolation forest. We want to uh, give the algorithm data and it needs to find the anomalies. So um, the easier it is to isolate, um, the higher the score, the harder it is to isolate. So if it's very deep in the tree, it's very hard to isolate and um, um, then it becomes normal. So you can imagine if you have a group of people that all behave the same, um, they all end up in, mm, in a very deep tree. If I have behavior that's abnormal, I will end up high up in the tree. And it's being easy and easier to isolate. Why isolation forest? That's the question I was asked these weeks many times. Why do you use isolation forest? Not because it's the best. And I refer here to a work of Tom Dietrich, and he found out that isolation forest is by far uh, the best. And uh, you can look this up. This is a paper that, uh, that Tom, uh, Tom wrote. So we thought, okay, if, if we want to find anomalies, we do it by isolation force. Why? Because it's the best. And uh, by chance, by, by pure chance, no, not by pure chance, uh, Big ML implemented isolation forest in their uh, machine learning platform. And with that comes that I always can export the isolation forest model to PMML, predictive mo model markup language, so I can execute it immediately in my production systems. That was one of the requirements for Big ML. Okay. Um, this is what we want to do. Automatic, fact-based, Rabobank risk appetite needs to be included, must be complete, efficient, and ef effective and efficient for all Rabobank NL, NL customers. So, um, up until now, up until January, this, these questions were filled in by employees. They will look at the customer and say, ah, okay, his transaction behavior is kind of okay. Uh, look at these transactions and find it okay. We had um, uh, only a fraction of our 10 million customers had such manual uh, review. Now we want to identify which customers are the most likely to be reviewed or, 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 or on the other side, who, what customers are totally okay. Um, because if, if, a, if a customer scores low on an anomaly, it acts like most of the group does. And then we might not, we might decide not to review him. Review means you need to make a document, uh, write things up, see how the customer behaves. And if, if, for example, his source of income is okay, or the cash deposit it does is okay, or where does, does his money come from? Um, if, if, if a customer, so the assumption is, so this is uh, what we do is all driven on assumption. The assumption is that if a customer behaves normally, it's a good customer. If it behaves abnormally, it is um, to be reviewed. It not, need not to be bad, it need not to be a crook, it need not to be a criminal, but it stands out in some way and we need to have a look at that. Um, to to, to eliminate the whole group of customers that are okay, kind of okay. What did we do? Um, we needed to split, and, and you will see this is nice. The, the previous presentations all come up with, with diagrams like this, and this is very nice because uh, if you work with BigML, these are the diagrams you will see, and this is nice to formulate a way what you do in, um, in, a, in like a, a kind of pipeline, if you would like that. We, split, we first split up our customer base in natural persons and organizations because I cannot compare natural persons to organizations. That's what we found out. 
if you have the Albert Hang a, a retailer, uh, then it's a different pattern than my pattern. So if I'm compared to Albert Hang, I'm anomalous or Albert Hang is anomalous. And if there are more people like me, Albert Hang is anomalous. Um, the first uh, take we did, we took all the supermarkets and put them in one peer group, in one group. Uh, that didn't work. Why not? Because we have a large retailer, Walmart in the US or Albert Heijn in the Netherlands, and we have the local grocery shop. They're both in the same peer group then, and mm -hmm, doesn't work because Albert Heijn always stands out. And perhaps the small one is more interesting because that's the one that's doing cash in an anomalous, uh, anomalous way. So we found an other way of segmenting uh, customers. At the first time, at natural persons, we ha also had to look, okay, can we look at all those almost eight, nine million customers at the same time and look for anomalies? Or do we need peer groups in there? And we had evidence that if we do anomaly detection on the whole group, we get uh, almost no good anomalies. If we, on the other hand, split them up in uh, age groups, we get nice anomalies. You can imagine um, you have a child and you opened an account for the child and hmm, because you know that you have some cash money and you want to circulate that cash money in some way and you use the, the account of your child to do that because you know, yeah, they might be looking at me, but most likely they will not look at my child. So if I would do that, and if I wanted to find that and not segment children apart from uh, adults, then it would not be anomalous because there are adults that do the same thing, but that's kind of normal. So we uh, split it up and we find now indeed in the group of children, we find anomalies. I'll show you later on. So uh, we group a peer group, we make an anomaly per peer group. That is um, for natural persons, we make 10 peer groups plus two. And for uh, organizations, we make approximately 20 peer groups. Uh, we filter on an anomaly score higher than 70% for NPs and higher than 60% uh, for um, for organizations, we create an explanation and we make an output. And this is what we do on a weekly basis. So every Sunday, Monday, this is running and producing a lot of new insights on customers. And over and over again. And for customers, uh, for organizations, we split on company size because we said, okay, the industry code is perhaps interesting, but we find it not that interesting. We want to look at company size, legal form, and if they are in any way cash intensive or um, they are in a cash intensive branch. Um, we're going to look at that uh, one, moment, uh, one moment later. Um, these are the questions we want to ask. We have, again, uh, a hybrid approach. We have business rules. We use them in risk shields. We can perfectly have fixed thresholds there and we do anomalous transactions behavior that's a, a catch all uh, underneath that is done in big amount. And we do that totally automatically. So some features we do this is this is nice this we, we know exactly uh, what people deposit and what uh, how many coupures how many the, the, the denominations are in such a deposit. So you can see here, um, somebody uh, could deposit a euro, 500 billions or 200 of 100 or 50 euros, 20 euros, 10 euros, five euros. This is a little bit feature space we create. It's, we, we create for every customer uh, 100 features and we do anomaly detection on those 100 features. What is some numbers we do on a base, uh, weekly basis? We do over 10 million transactions, over 10 million customers. We build a risk profile and we build a client profile in Risk Shield where we aggregate all accounts into a, um, a, uh, a client level. Um, you know, the, the, the Rabobank is a, is a, is a, is a bank that had 
500 different local banks and so you could spread your accounts over all the banks so we need to aggregate all the all the accounts and all the money into a single customer we do anomaly detection uh, by RaboML powered by BigML in approximately three hours and uh, we we spit out 63 million uh, risk indicators uh, that's our yes, no on the seven questions. And with every yes, no, we give an explanation. So not only give an explanation based upon the anomaly, but also on the non-anomaly. So this is an anomaly because of this and this and this, and this is not an anomaly because this and this and this. Okay. Uh, so impressive, 10 million every week, 63 million uh, risk indicators. Um, then this is some result, and this is what you see when you open a uh, big ML. You have a, um, um, a situation where you have here uh, some top anomalies, and the top anomaly here is uh, rep re represented by this explanation uh, and giving you the data points for this customer. That, and in all the learning, we do not include customer name, customer number, address, or zip code, or gender, or whatever. We all work on uh, totally anonymous data. And we get that this anomaly is because somebody does a lot of credits a day. So this, this, this private customer gets um, uh, per month, per, per half, the, 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 no, 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 let's say, let's the 373 um incoming payments a month ah, that's a little bit large for a private young customer the, the other the, the next example is a little bit um nicer um this is a lot of cash for a customer for a natural person customer this is a, a natural person that does 167,000 incoming cash that means he is standing in front of a machine and putting uh, in within a half a year 167,000 cash into his account. Uh, could be okay, could be totally legit, but it is an anomaly because nobody in his peer group does the same. Another example, this is a, a more recent example. We did this for uh, organizations, um, small organizations, it's MKB, it's SME. Uh, this is um, for the interesting, this is uh, an NCI, stands for non-cash intensive. So this, this is a, a guy that is in a non-cash in intensive industry and does 490,000 euros in half a year on cash. So whatever you could say, this is a an anomaly and we did not parameterize anything so we didn't put the threshold in we just let big ml find the anomaly we threw in the data we said okay this is the data this is the peer group find me the anomalies ah, but how good is it that's a good question how good is it so you need some metrics you could say yeah this is i can i can see clearly that this is wrong or we have to look at this perhaps it's wrongly classified or the customer is in a wrong group or the sbe or the industry code is wrong there could be data issues everything but this this is a candidate for being to being researched and this is real actual data this is done uh, last weekend so somebody has to look at this hey this is strange uh, do we need to talk to this customer was this the, was this the source of his funds uh, and that's that's the way we evaluate now. We evaluate based upon, hey, this is a trigger. Somebody is going to look at this and has a has a verdict on this uh, person or this company. And we need some metrics because how how good is it? How and how do you know it's good? So that's what we did. We did um, some WISML. We uh, with uh, Big ML, I created a script that says, okay, how how stable is now the how stable is the anomaly detector? And what we did, we did ah, let's let's see because one of the features of a uh, anomaly detector is the number of trees you build. And I thought, okay, let's let's do 
see if it's getting if it's a stable system and uh, this is a, is a is a group this is the group you saw here that's the 25 organizational those are 186,000 instances i have a forest size of 300 the sample size of 2048 so how stable is that anomaly detector how many of those 160 86,000 is he calling anomalous uh, in a run and anomalous is above 60 percent and i just made a script with big ml to say oh, i have a number of trees and a number of anomalies so when i build 50 trees he said now i have 740 anomalies if i have 200 trees i have approximately 800 anomalies so this is also saying that anomaly detection is not a uh, exact science so the same data provides different anomalies uh, in a range um, compared to the number of trees you uh, build and strangely if i increase the number of trees the number of the uh, the number of anomalies uh, decrease and same it's within approximately the 10 percent range that i find acceptable uh, in uh, the variance that is in here another way to look at uh, if it's good or it's not good to see um, let's look at anomalous anomalous um, as and the non-anomalous let's see if um, the anomaly detector really works and it really works for me if it sets apart the anomalous and the non-anomalous now i could ask the analyst to look at all the 800 we did that but also i want to have some metric to see that so i'm going to show you a little bit the the histograms of normal behavior customers versus abnormal anomaly behavior customers and i was very happy seeing this because this says hey i have here in the normal group that's the, that's from the same group uh, all the uh, customers around 10 15 percent anomaly score and anomalous is everything above 60 percent and what i see is that in for example these um, these um, the, the, uh, the, the 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 500 euros nobody in that group is doing that for example but in the anomaly group hey there is a lot of 500 euros going on so this is really showing me that the the way the anomalies are being found is re really stands out compared to the um, normal behavior of course this is very good news i made a nice spider chart of that that says okay if you look at the anomalies or the cash deposits and all the features around that then the gray line is the lo natural log of the normal behavior and the yellow line is the natural log of the abnormal behavior and this is exactly why we want to see this so we have a group here that really stands out on the cash behavior and this is what analysts surely surely wants want 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 to find and to find out so I took you a little bit to the project. The project is um, now finishing up. We started uh, in the summer last year, so holiday season last year, and we ended up before January. We made the whole uh, IT infrastructure ready for, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, do all the evaluations and anomaly detections in there and we have uh, great results we can see this as wicked problem because we didn't know on beforehand um, how to do it um, we, we we do not we were not completely sure that we covered all things we want to cover because we did some data selection we did some feature engineering um, based upon the business knowledge we have and we have to re-evaluate over and over again if we're doing good and um, i hope tom is going to talk 
uh, to you about uh, human in the loop anomaly detection because I think we need that because this is the first step in really professionalizing um, the, the way we look at customers in an automated way. And of course, we talked, we thought about and talked about bias. We talked about features that would be um, or not uh, be able to identify the, uh, the the people in that that should be addressed. And wicked problems that has a little bit to do with the unknown unknown. Um, because if you know what you want to do, if you know where you're going, if you know the outcome then you could easily make a prediction model that uh, best fits your problem space. Um, in thinking over this AML, customer due diligence, know your customer problem, uh, we, I think within a year we end up with a, a hybrid system. And the hybrid system will say, okay, we have a nominee detector for everything we do not know. And if out of that anomaly detector comes new patterns we need to address in our rules or in our more deterministic systems, then we will, we will opt the findings from the anomaly detector into the uh, more deterministic, uh, deterministic world. Because if it's deterministic, if I know what I need to find, please do it in a rule or in a machine learned uh, supervised model, have some examples, learn from that, look at the learning and then and let them find it in the, in, in the future. With this uh, project, we also came to all kinds of governance issues. Because how do you, how in, because I'm in a totally complex world of uh, risk adverse people that uh, work with compliance and risk. They say, yeah, Jan, this is a risk. How do you know that, that you find every, uh, every abnormal customer? I said, I, I, I cannot. That's, that's not the aim. I want to find abnormal patterns in the data and, abnormal, and the chance that if a customer is in the um, uh, uh, an abnormal, abnormal space, anomaly space, that he is behaving in such a way that we should look at him and review him is higher than um, in in the group that acts like the group does. So the peer group is also, if, if you look at that problem, the peer group definition is also very important. So if you make a peer group that consists of all crooks, then you get normal behavior. And how do you know that you find um, that you have not a, a peer group that is full of crooks or full of money launderers? Uh, so we carefully thought about that. So we did not, so the, the assumption could be that you do automatic peer grouping. So you do an, 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 a K means or G means on your total population. And then on based upon those grouping, you do anomaly detection, but then you can end up in a situation that you find all the anomalous people in a peer, in a peer group and nobody stands out. So we overcame that with uh, a de de deterministic way of uh, identifying the peer groups and the customers in there. So we are very, so the data for the peer groups is separate from the data we learn from and find anomalies in. In the governance, we have those um, wicked problems also in how to look at which mode we are. Uh, momentarily, we are in audit, under audit, and we are in the governance mode. So we are in the systems of record, meaning that um, I have an auditor now that says, Jan, yeah, that's good that you thought of that, but did you write it down? Um, nope. Um, have, do you have proof that this anomaly detection, this isolation force is the best? And then I refer back to, luckily, the paper of uh, Tom Dieterich, I said, yeah, uh, this is why we chose it, because it's the best. I said, oh, that's good. So I'm in the, I'm the, I'm in the wicked world of a governance uh, where innovation, where the, the risk we have is that innovation stands still and nobody ever dares to, to touch the system again or the features again. And that's where we have to 
step out. We have to be in the modus of that we can get and stay into system of innovation. Uh, and in the same time, be in a system of record. That means something for uh, the way you, uh, you um, form your teams. Um, a year ago, I was in a meeting with the project team and I said, I need somebody in the team that writes down what we do. And everybody said, yeah, yeah, no, documentation is not for us. We, we do that later. I said, I need a fixed person that writes down our, our concerns and our ways of thinking and just make PowerPoint presentation. And they said, no, nah, not needed. And now they come to the conclusion, ah, it would be a nice idea to have somebody who writes down what we do and we think. So we have to change, to, to change um, we, we have to do things in a reliable world with an agile mindset. And that's the daunting um, thing we have in our organization. We think like a runner, we think like um, we can do this, we can, we can make a new anomaly detection, we can we add new data. And the governance mode says, hmm, uh, you could not do that because you first need to go through four governance bodies within the bank and everybody has to sign off the risk. <clears throat> so that's a little bit uh, um, a thing we're still in. Um, then, um, of course, you come into some kind of ML ops situation change and adaptability where you have your business side decision engineering, where the business makes uh, well-informed decisions on data on questions, on modules, on, on rules, and uh, also on uh, the, um, the part of machine learning. Because the AI, uh, as you might have uh, figured out in my talk, uh, AI belongs and machine learning belongs more to the business than to the IT. I want to end up with a, a, a Dutch guy that um, Edsker Dijkstra, he was a mathematician and worked on machine learning long before I knew that machine learning was to be hot and hip and happening. Um, by the way, um, as well, Francisco, Martin and I, we did both a study in artificial intelligence and we came to the conclusion that case-based reasoning is some of the things you have to look and watch out for the coming year because we're going to work on that, bring in the reasoning in our machine learning environments and what Edgar Dijkstra said simplicity is a great virtue so everything I talked about and everything Big Mel does and the platforms look like it looks it looks very simply but that simplicity is a little bit um, deceiving because you need to require hard work and, um, and education to really appreciate it to appreciate the simplicity and, and the power of tools like Big ML and methods like anomaly detection to um, to, to do the work. And by the way, all the consultants that come in with nice tools and things, um, they make things more complex and I think simplicity is, simplicity is better. So, thank you.